I'm here today at the 2016 Canadian Science Policy Conference, and joining me today is Dr. Rewat Dionandan, who's a professor at the University of Ottawa Faculty of Health Sciences. So Rewat, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. So to get us started off, why don't you tell us a little bit about your research and what you're currently working on at Ottawa U? Sure. Well, I, I describe my research as subtending the three E's, education, ethics, and epidemiology. So I'm a global health epidemiologist, which means I crunch data from around the world to extract uh, nuanced kinds of health wisdom. And the other E, ethics, I look at bioethics usually, and my biggest uh, topic is the ethics of reproductive tourism. That's when mostly Westerners go to poor countries and hire women to have their babies for them. So I examine the ethics of that scenario. And it's the educational component that brings me here mostly, actually. So I do a lot of research into uh, novel ways of delivering educational content to health sciences and medical students, as well as public health students around the world. And of course, education being the foundation of evidence, which is furthermore the foundation of science policy, in my opinion. That's really why I'm here. Great. So what are some of the new strategies that you're, that you're working on and developing to, to impart scientific knowledge to, to students? Yeah, it's not so much strategies as, as vehicles and measuring uh, uh, innovations that may have an impact. So we're trying uh, videos now. So I partnered with a company in Germany to create these epidemiology videos that we distribute around the world. And we're trying to see if that can take the place or augment in-class learning. Um, then we tried sort of simulated learning activities like uh, an artificial research conference to get undergraduate students involved in science communication at a very meaningful uh, multi-dimensional level. Not just here's a paper, but here's my research. I'm going to defend it. You're going to attack it. And I'm going to acknowledge the holes in my research and that creates the scientific uh, conversation, which we, we pretend that we have in, in professional science. I, I want to implicate earlier on in their education. And some of the other uh, things I'm trying is I have a podcast where we try to, to have science education for the masses and that way it forces us to engage with the layperson, the non-scientific, non-technical audience to sort of bring us back down to earth. And um, we've also started a peer-reviewed journal that's run entirely by students and that of course allows them to enter into the world of scientific discourse earlier on. Fantastic. So well, how do you think that the universities and post-secondary education uh, institutions will change in the 21st century as information communication technology allows us to uh, scale up learning with, with online video and machine learning? Sure. The, the delivery mechanism is going to change and some things around you know how we parse content is going to change but I don't think the fundamental mission is going to change and by that I mean the human animal is hard-coded to learn through narrative and through multimodal experience. And we are all sort of come into this world as, as natural scientists and natural artists. We want to explore the world and experiment. We want to express ourselves. Somewhere between childhood and adulthood, that, that natural inclination has been lost. And by the way, that, that concept, that idea, was first explained to me by Carl Sagan, not directly to me, but you know, by his writings. And today, I think, is the anniversary of his birth. I think today is actually Carl Sagan's birthday, so it's, it's a relevant topic. Um, but what I was getting at is somewhere we, we've lost the ability to tap into that natural uh, innate scientist that every child has by the time we get to university. And so the mission for an educator in my mind is to somehow re-inculcate that innate enthusiasm that's the natural state of the human being. Right? Education shouldn't be difficult. It should be simply getting out of the way of the learner. So to answer your question more directly, how will it change? Well, the new tools will be applied, I hope to make that process easier. But it really doesn't matter because the mission remains the same. Right? But in the interim, in the short term, um, you know, the, the press is on for uh, cheaper ways of delivery, uh, ways of delivery that's, that has asynchronous scheduling so that people can come anytime they want, ways of communicating across the globe to make you know, travel uh, not required. And so, yes, the in-person class is becoming less and less uh, necessary. But I always have in my classes a lecture format in addition to an online lecturing format using a variety of like Google Hangouts, those kinds of tools. And I think the future, at least in the short term, is a blended approach using technology and old fashioned meet to meet contact. Right. So what do you think are some of the, the most promising approaches to transforming homework from a chore into a more playful, discovery-driven uh, fun thing? Well, you said the word, discovery. So right now, there's a movement in Canada towards discovery and inquiry-based education. 
and that's in the sort of kindergarten to 12, grade 12 uh, uh, stream. I would like to bring that into universities as well. Universities are still stuck in the let's memorize some stuff and regurgitate it phase, and that's important. I mean, there is a role for that. But we've, we've sort of um, uh, retreated from the holistic approach of a scientist being a natural philosopher and investigator in the universe and not so much someone who regurgitates facts. So what I would like to see is a return to the humanities, actually, so re-inject the humanities into science education. To bring that back to, si to science policy, what is policy but the enactment of, of procedure uh, towards a certain end is what's one definition, right? And the way that science policy plays a role in everyone's life is science policy brings in evidence uh, into the way that we form regulations and practices and policies. So we don't, we aren't able to sort of formulate policy unless we have evidence, and evidence must be delivered in the context of value and experience. And it's the value and experience that humanities bring. So I would like to see more science and humanities marriage. Right? So my students, for example, they don't write very well. And it's a tragedy because when they enter the real world, that's two-thirds of what they have to do is write compellingly and quickly and convincingly. The science aspect is actually a small component and the writing's harder. So I would like to see um, education at the, at the post secondary level redesigned from the ground up to have more of these um, humanistic humanities components at the foundational phase and then layer the science on top of that. So would you like to see uh, like storytelling and, and narrative and, and that become a core component of scientific education? I think as a, a delivery mechanism I think it should be an educational tool. I think um, having it hard encoded into curriculum is probably wrong um, because are you going to have students tell stories to you? I think it should be something, uh, something that the educator has to do. I'm going to give a lesson by telling you the origins of this theory. It actually uh, revolves around an individual, the discoverer, or at least someone who represents the story. And this is his or her tale. Because once you personalize something, the, the, the learner comes to it more readily. For example, when I teach epidemiology, I begin by telling the story of Jon Snow, who is the doctor who supposedly invented epidemiology. He's not the guy from Game of Thrones, okay? <laughs> it's this 1800s uh, yeah. doctor who... Busy guy. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, when I tell the story to high school kids, they first ask me, is that the guy from Game of Thrones? No! Their ice zombies are not real, <laughs> and Jon Snow did not you know, kill them all. But this fellow, um, there was a cholera epidemic in London, and he just counted cases of cholera, figured out that they lay along the water supply system, and epidemiology was born. And when I tell the story, it's more detailed than that, right? But the point I'm making is uh, I try to deliver the content in such a way that it's accessible at the human level because we are hardwired since birth to sit around a campfire or your grandma's uh, feet and hear the story being told rather than uh, study chapters one to three and memorize these portions and do these exercises. So again, to answer your question, no, we don't like hard encode narrative and storytelling into curriculum. We just offer it as an opportunity for educators uh, as one more tool for conveying content. So can you think of any uh, examples of um, how storytelling and how narrative have been used to enhance the effectiveness of any curricula <laughs> Not offhand. I mean, if you gave you a few minutes, I'd probably stop and think about it because I've read about this ex uh, extensively. Um, it's a growing field in in a variety of educational domains. Of course, the Aboriginal tradition. This is uh, nine tenths of, of their mechanism. Is the storytelling is is, con is um, conceptualizing all lessons within a mythology, and mythology is at its core storytelling. So if you, you know, if I go into the indigenous traditions, it's easier. Um, but I can't give you concrete examples right now. You got me on the spot. That's all right. <laughs> Fantastic. So as my last question before we wrap up, uh, where can we go online to learn more about your work? Or, and to find your podcast as well. Oh, sure. Well, my si uh, podcast is called Science Monkey. Okay. It's uh, sciencemonkey.ca. I co-host it with uh, my partner Graham Sanders, who is a professor at uh, University of Toronto in medieval Chinese poetry. So a scientist and a, a humanities scholar uh, deliver this content to the world, and he's the star. I'm not the star. I'm quite upset by that. He's, yeah. Um, and my website is dionandon.com. That's my last name, .com. If you go there, uh, you will find very embarrassing things in addition to some of the academic stuff. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, well, Raywell, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you. An absolute pleasure. Thank really you so much. Conversation. I appreciate you.